we're ready to start drawing the tree of life at this point during the semester. And the first tree of life that you'll ever draw in biology, this is probably in bio one, is the one that includes the domains of life. There are three domains of life, and they are the prokarya, the archae, and the eukarya. These three domains evolved from some common ancestor, the very first cell, and that very first cell over here would have been that 3.8 or 4 billion year old organism that was the very first cell to ever show up on Earth. After that we're going to have evolution which is going to lead to at least three clades which are these domains and each of these domains can be broken down into smaller groups because with each of them we're talking about a really big deep division of life. So for prokarya there's going to be several hundred million species inside of here, a whole bunch of archaea and a whole bunch of eukarya. So as we start breaking them down, when you break prokarya down that's basically what the class microbiology is going to be about. And so as you're taking general biology classes, you might go into the different kinds of prokarya, but more than likely it'll be very vague. Archae, same thing. But in a lot of general biology classes, you do break down eukarya into all of the groups that exist in there. So when we start to break down eukarya into the different groups that exist inside of it, <coughs> there are going to be usually five groups. And these five groups are called the supergroups, and so that phrase supergroups is talking about the different clades that you could find within eukarya. So before we start talking about the differences between these supergroups, we need to do a little bit of, of uh, explanation here. And the first thing to understand is that prokarya are unicellular, these are the bacteria. Archae are also all unicellular, and the vast majority of eukaryotes are also unicellular. And that might sound wrong, because you're like, wait, I'm a eukaryote, and I'm not unicellular, and all the other animals that I see walking around on Earth, they're eukaryotes, there's a lot of them, and they're not unicellular. And that's true, but it's just because you've got to remember that the amount of diversity that could be present in a single droplet of pond water is much greater than the amount of diversity that could be present across like an entire acre of forest, just because... These unicellular organisms are so small that you can fit a whole bunch of them into a very small area of space. So let's go back a little bit and let's talk about most of these eukaryotes. So most eukaryotes are going to be unicellular. They're going to be complex cells, but they're going to be these things that we're going to call protists. And protists are simply unicellular eukaryotes. And there's all sorts of different kinds of protists. Some of them are going to be photosynthetic. Some of them might be more like an amoeba, and they can change shape. Over here in this picture of some more protists, there were some that are kind of sort of multicellular, like kelp. It's kind of almost multicellular. Slime molds, they're kind of this somewhat multicellular precursor. But most of them are going to be these free-swimming or maybe sessile, heterotrophic or photosynthetic hunters or producers or things that are very active in like a droplet of pond water or maybe floating on the surface of the ocean. And when we look across all of the eukaryotes, most of the eukaryotes are these protists. They're these unicellular organisms. The things that are multicellular, stuff like giraffes and zebras and oak trees and stuff like that, they're really only going to fall within the plants and the animals. So if we're looking at life from an evolutionary perspective, most all life is unicellular, and most eukaryotes are also unicellular. Some of the eukaryotes evolved multicellularity, but most of them did not. And so these unicellular eukaryotes are all protists. That word protist is not a monophyletic group, which means it's technically not a good evolutionary word because it's leaving certain organisms out. When we say protist, we're not including the plants, the fungi, and the animals, even though they are eukaryotes. So it is a useful word. It has some problems, though, in that it's not very good in terms of including an ancestor plus all of its descendants. But either way, it's just this monophyletic term. So the next thing to understand is if we're going to draw this tree of life and we've got to include all the clades, <clears throat> different textbooks and different sources are going to draw that tree of life in different ways. This is a picture from um, Campbell, and it's got the different clades inside of the eukaryotes, and you can see how they actually got a pretty nice looking tree. Here's another one. Um, this is, I can't even remember where I got this from, it might have been Tree of Life from Berkeley, um, but they've got, you know, a real pretty tree. It's got dichotomous branching all throughout. Um, here's ones from primary literature. And so different versions that you could find online from different sources of the Tree of Life. And you'll notice they look really different from each other. I mean, this is not the same as this, and this definitely is not the same as that. 
This one's different from all of them, and it's very messy. You'll notice it all comes down to one branch point where just everything happens all of a sudden, and you can see this question mark that's been placed. And so the reason why these trees look different from one another once we get to the eukaryotes is because this branch point where you get these very first eukaryotes was 2.1 billion years ago. It's with organisms that would have been very, very small, that don't leave very good fossil records, and there's only so much we can do in terms of uh, using DNA, particularly because eukaryotes are going to come from endosymbiotic events, where one cell is engulfed by another cell. So that makes it really difficult to try to do any kind of genetic reconstruction. So rather than try and say that this one evolves first, then this one, or that they go in any particular order, when we're not 100% sure, a lot of instructors, including myself, a lot of professors, are going to talk about these supergroups. And they're going to treat this node where we have the base of the eukaryotes as what's called a polytomy. A polytomy right here is the same thing as what's being depicted in this picture. And what it means is that we know evolution works with one new species at a time. So this tree right here, this would be like the way that life really does work. We go one branch at a time. The thing is that we don't know when we're talking about the eukaryotes, which one of these groups came first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. So rather than pretend like we know something that we don't, we're just going to acknowledge that this is the point where we do not know what happens. So when we get out here, this is more recent in time, and a lot of the diversification has already happened, so we can figure out the relationships among these organisms much more easily, or at least have a good idea about who's related to whom. But over here at the very base of the tree, this is a mystery, and for all we know, it's going to be a mystery forever. Um, it it kind of doesn't matter in terms of what happens out here, but right now we don't know what's going over and on over here at the, that beginning. So if we go back to how we're going to draw this in our big tree of life, we've got these three domains. They all fall, sorry, those three domains are going to describe all of life on the planet, and eukarya is going to be broken up into these five supergroups. The five supergroups are very different from one another. So like Chromo violata has got completely different characteristics from Excavata or Rhizaria. So the common names for these groups are in red here. And these are the ways that you can kind of, in your mind, remember broadly how one supergroup is different from another supergroup. So like the Unicanta are the animals, the plants, the Archeoplastida. Rhizaria includes many amoeboid forms. The chromoviolata include diatoms, plus a lot of other things, and excavata includes organisms that look similar to euglena. So these are just kind of some exemplar organisms to try to maybe remind you how one supergroup is different from another. We could then break each of those supergroups down even further. I mean, I've just got one example here, but there's more than just what's shown there, and that's how we get this other tree. And so if someone is talking about a supergroup, they're talking about these five out here, if someone's talking about, like, algae, for example, you can look at your tree and say, yeah, algae is not a very useful term because there's actually red algae, green algae, there's golden algae, there's brown algae, and they're not all inside of the same group. Golden algae and brown algae are in the stromatopiles, which are inside of Chromo violata, whereas red and green algae are both inside of Archeoplastida. They don't come from the same ancestor. They're a different endosymbiotic event. And so... The next step is to then learn more characteristics and more traits of each of these eukaryotic supergroups, and that'll be the subject of the next couple videos.